Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Ison Gyu, who's a professor of computing and mathematical sciences at Caltech. He was previously a research scientist at Disney Research, and before that, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the machine learning department and the iLab at CMU. He received a PhD from Cornell University and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I think I've seen a version of this talk online, uh, maybe at a Caltech event. I think it was in a, a machine learning for science event. I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, I really loved the breadth and impact of this work, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, as usual, the talk will be around 45 minutes long, followed by a 15 minutes live Q&A. Uh, Yizum will also be looking at the questions coming in uh, through the chat. You can submit your questions throughout the talk and we'll respond um, there to um, questions about clarifications or pointers to code or anything like that. Uh, I will be selecting some of those questions, maybe in clusters, uh, to bring to the live Q&A. And usually I will take questions that um, deserve a longer discussion or maybe need uh, more discussion than what you can write in the chat box. Um, so overall, thank you so much, uh, Yisong, for presenting today. And without further ado, I will end it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the talk. My name is Yisong Yu, and I'm a professor at Caltech studying machine learning. Today, I'll be talking about some of the work that my group and our collaborators have been working on over the last several years in the area of AI for adaptive experiment design. So the premise of the talk is about studying goal-oriented experiment design. So on the left side, you see the experiment designer, which can be human and increasingly is an algorithm or some combination thereof. On the right side, you have the experimental platform, which is increasingly automatable or programmable to, to run experiments automatically or semi-automatically. And so the workflow is as follows. The experiment designer designs an experiment, runs that experiment on the platform. What we get back from the platform is a measurement of the outcome of the experiment. The experiment designer then takes that measurement, updates its internal models of the phenomenon it's trying to capture, plans another experiment, and then this process continues. Uh, this process is iterative and adaptive in the sense that uh, we do this multiple rounds, and that the design of new experiments is conditioned on the measurement outcomes of previous experiments. The goal is to maximize some notion of utility, for, such as finding the best design or the best outcome that's most useful for some downstream task. And so there are many applications that fit into this paradigm, from robotics and control, to drug discovery, to biochemistry design, to material science, and the list goes on and on and on. So this is a really, really a uh, useful way of thinking about goal-oriented experiment design. And another character that I like to think about when studying this area uh, is the following. And keep in mind that this is just a caricature, but I think it illustrates an important point. So a brilliant Caltech scientist discovers a new phenomenon in nature, decides through rigorous statistical testing and experimentation that it's statistically significant, and they publish a nature paper. And their group is very excited. Some pharmaceutical company, let's say, realizes that this result is representative of a larger hypothesis space of possible results. And somewhere in this larger hypothesis space is one that's useful in the, in the sense that it's commercially viable, safe, uh, effective in humans, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the path from point A to point B is fraught with setbacks, uh, complexities that are uh, uh, unimagined before, and and mistakes. And so this very labor intensive and mistake ridden and just burdensome process uh, is increasingly placing a burden on the pipeline from the fundamental nature result to a one that's actually useful to society. And so you could think of AI for goal-oriented experiment design as thinking of automatic or semi-automatic ways of speeding up this process to reduce costs and increase efficiency to getting from point A to point B. And so to contrast this with the kind of supervised learning, a version of machine learning that has become so popular in industry today, uh, we can think of it as follows. So in batch supervised learning, you have your raw data, you have your signal that you're trying to regress to or predict. Here it's, uh, let's say, movie ratings. You feed those into a computer, you run an algorithm, and you train a regressor, uh, f of x, that, that can predict y. And of course, uh, the key thing to note here is that in this standard setup, all the data is collected up front. Uh, in the setup that I described, you can think of experiment design as a form of interactive learning rather than batch learning where all the data is collected up front. So instead, the data is collected on the fly, 
And in the extreme case, we have no data at all that's available a priori. Uh, there's a limited budget on data collection, so you can't just spend all your resources collecting all possible data that might be useful. You have to be very selective and strategic in how you collect data. And so the question then becomes, in addition to the standard learning problems that people solve in batch supervised learning, how do you choose which data to collect? And so from this viewpoint, you can think of three general classes of interactive learning uh, that sort of studies the different versions of this problem depending on your goal. The first version is called active learning, where the goal is to discover truth. In other words, we want to build as, as accurate a model of some naturalistic phenomenon as we can. The second setting is called optimization, typically Bayesian optimization. And the goal is, at the conclusion of the experiments, find the single best outcome. Uh, for example, if we're doing protein design, find the single best protein for some specific task. And so the goal here is to maximize the utility of the final prediction. The third idea is called multi-arm bandits or disbandits. And the goal is to maximize utility over time. So a canonical example here is a recommender system, where every experiment we run, in this case, is run on a user where we're trying to figure out what this user likes to consume. And so the utility of every experiment is matters rather than just the final utility. The focus of this talk is going to be the middle option, Bayesian optimization. Uh, so here's the high-level setup. And, we're, and for the purposes of this talk, we're going to assume that we're Bayesian um, for convenience, although we want, you don't have to be. So what we're given is an input space x. We have an unknown fitness function, f of x, that maps any design in the input space to some fitness measurement. We, we are Bayesians who maintain a posterior distribution over possible fitness functions given the measurements that we've collected already. And so the experiment designer chooses an experiment to run at time step little t. The we run the experiment. We get back a measurement y sub little t. We add x t y t to our data set of measurements. We update our posterior. And based on that updated posterior, we iterate and we do this process again. And so in this very basic setup, there are, of course, many algorithms that have been studied in the past um, that perform well. Uh, examples include uh, upper confidence bound algorithms and posterior sampling, and there are many others. So this would be our starting point. And from this starting point, uh, the first thing I'll do is to briefly walk through why the three paradigms, active learning, Bayesian optimization, and multi-arm bandits might be interesting and then go into the meat of the talk, which is a technical discussion and application discussion of Bayesian optimization. So first, let's start with active learning. So here's a very, very simple example with one feature dimension. And the goal is to learn a threshold function in a noise-free setting. So what this means is uh, we sample a bunch of data. So this is normal passive learning where you just sample passively from the, from the data set. And so here we're doing binary classification. And then we learn a model that separates the positive examples from the negative examples in this one dimensional case. So this is passive learning. In active learning, you actually query the data actively. Um, so yeah, by the way, here's the true model. So we're very close to the true model. In active learning, we query the data sort of with purpose rather than passive. So in this very simple example, you can think of active learning as a form of binary search. So first we query the middle of our feature space and we get a data point and we see that it's positive. Because we're in the noise free setting in this very simple example, this observation actually bisects the hypothesis space of where the threshold is. So now we know that the threshold must be in the right half. So we sample the middle of the right half of the feature space, we do a query, we see that it's negative, And this again bisects the remaining hypothesis space. And this process continues just like it does in binary search until we've exhausted our budget. And so here's just a simple thought experiment to compare the, the cost of collecting data in the passive normal batch learning setup with active learning. And here's the idea. How many samples do we need to collect to be within epsilon of the true model? In passive learning, it's roughly big O of one over epsilon where as epsilon tends towards zero, this number increases. In active learning, 
it's big O of log of one over epsilon as epsilon tends towards zero. So as epsilon tends towards zero, which means you want to learn a more and more accurate model, active learning is exponentially more sample efficient than passive learning. So this is just a simple example to illustrate the power of interactive learning to purposefully collect data when you don't have data collected up front. In Bayesian optimization, uh, one example that I like to think about is the work on protein design. So X here is the space of proteins or a representation of the space of proteins. F of X is the fitness landscape of this protein for a specific task. For example, uh, thermal stability or um, reflectivity or fluorescence. And so the idea, and this is a diagram I, I stole from my colleague Francis Arnold here at Caltech, is you sort of pick some mutations over reference, pro, uh, reference amino acid chain, you run the experiments to, that synthesizes these proteins and takes a measurement. From the output of this measurement, you update your model and you repeat this process. So this is exactly a form of Bayesian optimization. And the goal, like in Bayesian optimization, is that at the end of this experimentation, we come out with the best protein that we possibly could with a limited number of experiments. The last example is in multi-arm bandits. And so to think about multi-arm bandits, let's think about the idea of a clinical trial or some sort of trial on, that involves human subjects. And so the standard way of thinking about experiment design is static experiment design, uh, which is pre-planned. And so the idea is that you know, we have a subject who joins the experiment. We have a pre-planned uh, trial, which in this case uniformly chooses with 50-50 odds, whether to give the subject the treatment uh, or the placebo. The next subject comes, and then we flip a 50-50 coin to give the subject the treatment or the placebo, and this process continues. <clears throat> and this is called static experiment design. Again, this is a gross oversimplification of how things actually work in practice, which is much more complicated, but it's meant to illustrate a mathematical point. Bandits you can think of in contrast to static experiment design as an adaptive experiment design where we adapt the subsequent trials in the experiment based on the outcomes of the previous trials. So uh, here for simplicity, let's assume that we can actually measure the outcome of a treatment instantaneously, although in practice there's often a lag. And so the first subject comes, our algorithm chooses to give the subject a treatment and we observe a positive outcome. The second subject arrives our algorithm chooses to give the subject a placebo and we observe a negative outcome. The next subject arrives, our algorithm chooses to give the subject a treatment and we observe a positive outcome. At this point, uh, we may have some confidence, not a lot, but a non-zero amount of confidence that the treatment might be uh, more effective than the placebo. And so we might want to bias the coin away from 50-50 towards giving uh, the, the future subjects the treatment more likely than the placebo. And so uh, the idea here is that each experiment matters. And so here's a, a screenshot from a New York Times article from about 10 years ago, where you had two cousins, uh, both afflicted with a rare form of aggressive uh, melanoma. Uh, one subject was given uh, a treatment uh, of an experimental drug uh, that seemed promising. The other was given standard chemotherapy, which was known at the time to not be effective. And so one person lived healthfully for much longer than the other one, the person who received the treatment. And so the idea here is that each experiment matters. Uh, mo in static experiment design, the idea is that at the conclusion of the experiment, we want to be as confident as possible that future subjects, future people can be treated as reliably as possible. In adaptive experiment design, which is what Bandits tries to model, uh, the idea is that, well, every subject in the experiment design also matters. And so this is a notion called cumulative regret. And of course, this is what I'm describing is a gross oversimplification of what actually happens in practice, uh, but it's, you know, I think it's an interesting thought experiment that illustrates the mathematical point. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, we have three settings, active learning, Bayesian optimization, and multi-arm Bandits, they use a very similar, at least in this simple setup, a very similar interaction protocol where you run an experiment, you measure an outcome. And this is basically a form of sequential experiment design. In active learning, the goal is to learn 
the, 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 the function that we're modeling as accurately as possible, which I, which I would call discovering truth. In optimization or Bayesian optimization, the goal is to find the maximizer, so I, which I denote here as X star. And so only, only the best result that we found so far matters at the end of the experiments. In bandits, the goal is to optimize the cumulative utility or to minimize the cumulative regret of the opportunity cost of not having treated everyone with the best possible outcome. In, with, in other words, each experiment matters in terms of the utility we derive from it. Uh, so in my lab, uh, we study the foundations of machine learning in, in addition to applications. And so a lot of these applications that I'll be talking about next motivate the study of algorithmic and theoretical questions, such as, can we analyze the speed of convergence to find the maximizer? Can we guarantee satisfying side constraints while we're running experiments, such as safety? Can we deal with corrupt or, or indirect measurements in a principled way in, in applications where we cannot directly measure the outcome of experiments? Can we efficiently search through high dimensional combinatorial design spaces? And can we incorporate domain knowledge such as physics in order to converge much more fast, much more quickly than without using such domain knowledge? And so I'm not gonna talk about these uh, questions in detail in this talk, but I encourage you to read the papers for details if you're interested. Okay, so now let's talk about the meat of this presentation, which is real world Bayesian optimization. And I will talk mainly about two applications the, in safety and preference-based Bayesian optimization and multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization. And then I will touch on a few other aspects as well. So let's start with the first project in real world Bayesian optimization that incorporates safety and preferences. So first, let me start by talking about the motivating application. And that is a collaboration uh, with Joel Burdick and other collaborators in trying to treat lower spine injury, uh, lower spinal cord injuries. So on, you see here uh, in, the, in the screen, a, a photo of a person who uh, had injured his uh, spine and is effectively paralyzed from the waist down. Cannot, he cannot stand or walk of his own power. What Joe Burdick and his collaborators have been working on is using a neural uh, epidural electrostimulator, which is implanted inside the spinal uh, column close to the spinal cord. And it induces an electromagnetic field that helps the patient regain some lower limb mobility. At least that's the goal. And so, it, so this epidural electrostimulator is basically a set of 16 nodes. Each one can be uh, positively or negatively charged with various fluctuations or frequencies in the, um, in the wavelength of the modulation. And so uh, essentially this is a, a personalized therapy problem because every patient is unique. Their physiology is unique. Their, um, their injury is unique. There's even variability in where you implant the device surgically. And so there are many different ways we can configure this device and we need to basically tailor this configuration to optimize uh, its effect on each individual patient. And that's the basic idea. So here's the learning setup. We have our electrode array that's applying a experiment via this uh, stimulation therapy. So we apply stimulus. We receive a response, uh, some way of measuring uh, how well the patient let is, let's say, standing in response to the stimulus. We update our posterior, we iterate. So this is how the basic setup maps to this problem. Now let's talk about the real world challenges on top of the basic setup. First off, there are many actions, millions to billions, depending on your level of discretization. So what you see on the right is two different settings of the device and a visualization of the electric potential field. Measuring utility is difficult. Like how do you measure in a quantitative way how well someone is standing? And of course, there are safety concerns because uh, some of these settings may cause the patient pain or discomfort. So let's tackle these one at a time. Uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the high dimensional aspect, we will use a method that's very popular called Gaussian processes. A Gaussian process is defined by a mean function and a covariance or kernel function. And one can, and it's a distribution over functions. And you can sample a function from the Gaussian process uh, using many standard methods, 
And this function satisfies, this function that we sample satisfies various properties. For instance, the expected value of this function when queried at data point x is mu of x. The correlation of f of x1 and f of x2 for a randomly sampled function is equal to the covariance or kernel function. And so you could think of um, these Gaussian processes as a generalization of the standard multivariate Gaussian distribution. And in fact, if your input domain is finite, for example, there's only 10 possibilities of x, then this reduces to a standard uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. The benefits of Gaussian processes are that it gives us a principled way to reason about uncertainty. So if we were to query a stimulus x, now, a priori, what is the spread of possible outcomes that we might get as a response variable? It allows us to measure correlations over the input space. So measuring f at x1 gives us some information about what f of x2 might be. And we can work with domain experts to think about how to build these correlations to reduce the dimensionality of the input space to something that's much lower dimensional that leads to a tractable experiment design problem. And so that's the main benefit of using Gaussian processes in this setting. And so that's how we solve the first challenge. So Gaussian processes with low dimensional kernels. Next, let's talk about measuring utility. So measuring utility, which in this case is how well the subject is standing, is actually very challenging. The doctors themselves may have uh, trouble calibrating their judgments of how well a, a patient is standing. And, that, and it could vary from time of day, day of week, you know, how, how tired the, the doctors are in making these evaluations. Even the, the patient's self-evaluations can vary a lot because this whole thing is just very subjective. It's a very subjective judgment. And so what we found based on prior work is that measuring how well we're doing based on preference feedback is much more reliable. So instead of asking how well is the patient standing, we ask given, for instance, given these two stimuli, which one helps the patient stand better? And so that's the basic idea. And so, uh, this idea has been studied in a wide range of, um, you know, um, preference elicitation experiments, including my own thesis work in preference elicitation for web search. So here the basic idea is you have two search engine retrieval functions with different rankings uh, of results based on a search query. And rather than using clicks on search results as a direct measurement of which ranking is better, we simply interleave them in this case into an interleave ranking and then the clicks then are votes on which ranking is preferred and this ends up giving a much more reliable judgment of which ranking function is better rather than absolute judgments and we see this you know in various experiments here's one that was done about uh, 10 years ago now uh, on a commercial search engine at yahoo where we see that um, in comparison to absolute metrics such as clicks at rank one interleaving is about 100 times in this particular experiment, about 100 times uh, more sensitive than absolute metrics, and it's sometimes more reliable as well because some of the absolute metrics actually diverge uh, from, in this case, the ground truth of where we know from careful inspection which retrieval function is better. So this is just a note to say that these preference elicitation methods really do make a big difference in these real-world uh, subjective feedback problems. And so that's how we're gonna measure utility with preference feedback. The final thing is safety. So the way that we're gonna model safety, and this is a fairly standard approach, increasingly so in this area now, is to use a separate Gaussian process, a safety model. And so imagine that we had a Gaussian process that models how safe an action is. We may not know a priori where, where all the safe actions are. We set a safety threshold. So if you actually take an action that is, whose safety value is below the safety threshold, then it's deemed unsafe for the patient. And so for instance, the action uh, at uh, intersecting the red line is unsafe because it goes below the safety threshold. The blue line, the action at the blue line is safe because it is above the safety threshold. And in, in fact, our confidence of it is above the safety threshold. The purple line is almost unsafe. So, you know, we have this high confidence region of, you know, just how safe or unsafe this purple line is. Uh, but the lower bound, as you see, of the confidence interval is above the safety threshold. So we know that this, um, we know that uh, with high probability, uh, this action is safe, although it might be close to being unsafe. 
So that's the basic idea. And so we do uncertainty quantification of safety using Gaussian processes with a separate Gaussian process on safety. Okay, so here's the full learning setup. We have uh, our epidural electrostimulator electrode array. It applies, we, we have an algorithm that uses it to apply multiple stimuli at, in a batch. We observe how the patient is standing in a batch. We do a ranking or preference response on this batch based off which standing um, posture is better as judged by doctors in this batch. And then we repeat this process while guaranteeing safety to the patient. So uh, each of these pieces was studied at a different uh, separate project, although we ended up putting them together into a single framework. The different pieces are uh, you know, shown in the references at the bottom. And so just to give a cartoon of how the algorithm works, uh, we have an initial safe action, which is easy to do in the, our application because you just don't set the voltage too high. And then this action based on our kernel that's designed with domain experts uh, specifies a safety region where we know that um, uh, everything in the safety region is, is with high probability safe. What the algorithm first does is that it tries to expand the safe region by, by running an experiment at the boundary of the safe region and measuring safety. And here we see that we see um, that it's very safe. And that allows us to expand the safety region because we updated our posterior. And we do this again. And now at this part of the boundary of the safety region, we, we take a measurement um, where the lower confidence bound is almost unsafe. And then when we actually take the measurement on safety, we realize that, aha, uh -huh, it actually is almost unsafe. So we cannot expand the safe region in this part any further. So we try a different part and we keep expanding. And at some point, we've expanded as far as we can from the initial safe action. And then we apply st any standard Bayesian optimization approach, uh, such as the ones I commented on in the very beginning of this talk, on this reachable safety region. Um, and then we just find the optimal solution. So in other words, we first maximize the safety region and we do so by being optimistic in the face of uncertainty and to identify the reachable safety region. Uh, and this region is approximately maximal with convergence guarantees. And then we have this meta framework where after we do this first step, we then reduce the problem to any standard Bayesian optimization problem, which can be solved by any standard Bayesian optimization algorithm. And in doing so, we can actually inherit their theoretical guarantees. So this is a nice framework because it is both conceptually uh, modular, which means it's easy to deploy in many applications. And this modularity is also nice because it allows us to theoretically reason about the behavior of the algorithm in a modular way as well. And so here's an example of this algorithm and, re and related algorithms. We've developed a class of algorithms in this area in action. So this subject um, has been paralyzed uh, for at least two years prior to this uh, experiment. And here he is standing for the first time, I believe, with the help of this type of treatment. We can also do quantitative uh, evaluations where um, we do a postdoc evaluation of how well our algorithm is doing relative to the phys uh, physician's uh, best attempt at finding a good treatment. And roughly what you see here is that at the end of our algorithm's experimentation, it's found a setting for this patient that is 40% uh, better than the physician's best personal judgment. Okay, so that concludes the first application that I'll talk about in detail. The next application that I'll talk about in detail is on Bayesian optimization in multi-fidelity experiment design. And so let's start again with the motivating application that started this all. And that's at a collaboration with Harry Atwater's group at Caltech on uh, nanophotonic structure design. So what you see in, this, in these images is basically a camera sensor. And what happens is in the diagram on the left is that you have an, a photon well um, that traps the photon. And then the slit at the bottom uh, filters light and only allows a certain wavelength of light through. And how you control for what wavelength of light to be sensitive to, the signal to noise ratio and all that stuff is based on a number of parameters of the design of this 
uh, nanostructure, such as the oxide thickness, the slit width, the mirror spacing, so, and so on and so forth. After you design these things, you put them in an array, uh, such as the images on the right, to build sort of new camera sensors. The main reason why people are interested in this is in hyperspectral imaging, where uh, you can actually have, the, if you actually have these cameras that uh, have very a narrow band filtering of different wavelengths of light, then you can actually extract a lot of information, let's say from the Earth's surface, based off of the um, wavelength profiles. So this is much more uh, sensitive than your standard RGB cameras. The way you evaluate fitness is as follows. You have your um, uh, light filter des structure design. You can actually evaluate uh, exactly its transmission profile of wavelengths of light by solving Maxwell's equations with any kind of finite difference temporal difference solver. And so that you see that on the right. So you see here that this particular structure uh, is highly sensitive to light at the 550 nanometer wavelength with some sensitivity to other wavelengths as well. Depending on your target wavelength that you want to be sensitive to, um, you can map that to a fitness function, which is also called a figure of merit in the nanophotonics community that basically says, what is the utility of this particular design in, in respect to um, the, 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 the specificity of filtering that wavelength of light, the signal to noise ratio, and a few other components as well. So this is all fairly standard in the nanophotonics community. One thing that's tricky about uh, solving Maxwell's equations is that solving Maxwell's equations can be very expensive. If you solve Maxwell's equations arbitrarily accurately, then what you get back is a result that faithfully uh, replicates a physical experiment because we're basically operating on first principle physics at this point. What that means is, of course, you need a very fine-grained resolution with which to run and simulate Maxwell's equations. So what you see on the bottom is uh, three simulations, one at the highest fidelity and one nanometer by one nanometer resolution. On the right, at the, in this case, the coarsest fidelity at three nanometer by three nanometer resolution. And the outcome of the experiments differ because of the resolution. And the fundamental question we ask is, OK, the coarse resolution in this case is nine times cheaper to run than the fine resolution. In three dimensions, it would be 27 times cheaper to run. If most of the structures that we might hypothesize to experiment with are poor performing in terms of its utility, do we need to accurately simulate bad structures? So that's the, that's the sort of the main sort of high level intellectual question. And you could sort of, um, make this more formal by thinking about different fitness functions. So if one is the first is the fitness function, the black line, on the utility on the reference fine-grained resolution, which is the utility function that we care about. The second one, the blue line, is an auxiliary fitness function, which is the measurements that we get from running experiments on a coarse-grained uh, simulation. And there's some amount of correlation between the two, but you know, it's their exact relationship is unknown. And so here's the learning setup motivated by these observations. So in this exa example, we have three levels of experiments from cheapest and coarsest to most expensive and finest, which is the reference resolution. We have the parameters of our experiment. In this case, we have seven parameters. Our experiment design algorithm chooses a design and then also chooses a fidelity level. We get back a measurement based on running an experiment at that fidelity level. We update our posterior and we repeat. So that's the basic learning setup. So now let me talk about the algorithmic insights of how we design our algorithm. So the first thing that we do is we run a number of experiments that couple the coarse grain and the fine grain uh, at the same experiments or roughly the same experiments. And here for simplicity, I'll assume there's only two levels of experiments, low level and, and fine grain level. Although in practice, there can be more. And what this allows us to do is actually calibrate the relationship of the auxiliary fitness function and the target fitness function. This gives us a way of saying, OK, here it's systematically over predicting. Here it's systematically under predicting, stuff like that, in terms of the relationship between the auxiliary to the target. 
after that, we run a bunch of coarse grain simulations uh, to quickly eliminate bad structures, occasionally running a fine grain simulation to improve our uh, correspondence between the fine between the target fitness function and auxiliary fitness function. But assuming that we have a rough correspondence between the two, we can use the coarse grain fitness function and the coarse grain experiments to eliminate things that cannot possibly be high performing in the fine grain or target fitness function. After that, we switch to only using the fine grain fitness function and, and the high level uh, fidelity experiments, and we fine tune in the small region that has not been eliminated to find the optimal design. So this again is a meta framework. We want to use the coarse level experiments as much as possible because they're so much cheaper than the fine grain experiments. We periodically check the fine grain experiments to calibrate the utility functions between, uh, between the two levels. And then we switch to fine grain only at the very end. And again, we can use any Bayesian optimization algorithm as a subroutine. So this is again a meta framework. And the way that we tie this meta framework together is by studying a novel form, a new form of cost weighted value of information that says, what is the value of the information that I expect to get for running this experiment at this level of fidelity? And how do I balance that against the cost of running that experiment? So here's one experiment that we ran um, where uh, the red line is our approach and uh, the light green line, particle swarm, is a very standard state-of-the-art approach in nanophotonics design. And here we have, in this experiment, we have three fidelities with very different costs. And what you see here is that in the beginning, our approach, the red line, spends quite a bit of time eliminating uh, large regions of the design space as cannot be optimal. And then once it switches over to only using the fine grain experiments to fine tune the remaining region, it quickly uh, can converge to the best performing uh, design. And indeed, uh, we found that in, in many settings, our approach is state of the art. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to go over a few other experiments and collaborations in a range of other domains uh, to give you a flavor of just how broadly this idea can be applied. So uh, the first one is in batch stochastic Bayesian optimization. And so this was motivated by um, applications to protein design. So in protein design, uh, the design space is an amino acid chain, like in, um, which is similar to DNA, but amino acids have 20 bases that you can choose from. And the problem, of course, is that designing, amino, designing new proteins, which is amino acid chains, quickly becomes a combinatorial problem. Uh, furthermore, um, in many design settings, uh, you don't have full control over the design. You can simply, uh, it's, it's often cheaper or more practical to um, choose which sites to mutate, but then the mutations themselves can be probabilistic. You don't have, you don't have fine grade control or, or having fine grade control can be expensive. And so you're, you're faced with a two prong problem. One is your actual design process you don't have full control over. And the second one is the full design space is combinatorial. And so we studied how to uh, formulate Bayesian optimization problems given these two real world constraints. And so uh, that is studied in, in the uh, citation at the bottom. And so here's just one sort of experiment that we um, got out of uh, this study, which is that you can, through just a few rounds of experimentation, arrive at a high performing, in this case, protein uh, compared to the wild type. Uh, we've also f studied how to integrate uh, domain knowledge, such as physics, into the design process. We've also studied how to do this in a way that's non-Bayesian. So everything up to now, we've made a very strong Bayesian assumption, which allows us to have well-defined confidence intervals about how well we're doing. Um, now, that's OK in most applications, but there are some applications where you really want more conservative confidence intervals because even the smallest amount of unsafe actions can lead to catastrophic failures. So here is an example where we're trying to land a drone as quickly as possible uh, without crashing. And so 
we need to be able to model the interaction of the aerodynamics of the drone with a boundary condition such as the ground. And if we don't do this well, the drone can actually crash. And so this leads to us to want to be very data efficient and also to have more conservative bounds uh, than Bayesian, standard Bayesian bounds. And so here's just one experiment that we did where um, if, you, if you look at our approach, which is uh, based on uh, deep robust regression, the black line, uh, in addition to a non-Bayesian form of um, calibration, we outperform many Bayesian approaches based on Gaussian processes um, because we can do a more accurate model of the physics. Another example is if you want to do this kind of experiment design for more dynamical processes at, with, higher, with many degrees of freedom and subjectivity and um, and in, and in our case, in the context of exoskeletons. So the basic idea is that we have an exoskeleton platform and we want to personalize the settings of this exoskeleton uh, to the comfort and safety and, and therapeutic benefits potentially of the subject. And so you, it's similar to the first setting that I talked about, but it can be um, much more dynamic in the, um, in the, the experiment design. And so here's just a video of how this would play out in practice. We have a subject in the, in the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is assisting the subject in walking, and the subject is, you know, reports things like comfort and safety. And then we try to tune the exoskeleton's gait to the preferences of the subjective preferences of the user. Other things include human cognitive factors, uh, such as um, in machine teaching. So for instance, if we think of experiment design as trying to uh, figure out the right way to build tutoring systems to teach humans to become more proficient in a domain, so here the domain is bird watching, then it's good to model human cognitive factors. So on the example on the left, we have interpretable teaching where we have two species of birds that are very difficult to discriminate between the two. And what we provide to the uh, to the user is not only a label, you know, what species of bird this is in this image, but also an explanation to help the user uh, discriminate between uh, neighboring species of birds. On the right, you see an experiment on teaching forgetful learners, uh, which where our algorithm, which generalizes the conventional space repetition algorithm that's used in products like Duolingo. Um, studies, you know, if based on different levels of difficulty in different concepts, how do you do an adaptive tutoring an, or an adaptive space repetition type algorithm to help uh, forgetful learners remember things more effectively? And so just to summarize, um, I hope I've convinced you that uh, AI methods for adaptive experiment design holds a lot of promise both in practice and in terms of fundamental algorithm design. And this is motivated by the fact that experimental platforms are increasingly automated by now. And this motivates the use of these algorithmic frameworks such as active learning, Bayesian optimization, and bandits. Uh, once you move towards real world problems, you have to be able to incorporate in a principled way real world considerations such as dealing with indirect measurements, dealing with constraints such as safety, and incorporating domain knowledge such as dynamics or physics and human factors. And of course, once you can do so, you can get them working on many, many cool applications as well. Finally, I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially the students and postdocs in the top row who did the lion's share of the work that I'm presenting today. And that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Great, that, that, was, that was a great talk. Uh, thank you so much, Izong. Um, there have been a few questions during the talk. I think you've answered a bunch of them. Um, so maybe I will get started by asking asking a few questions that I had. Uh, one of them was around uh, super interesting. Your, your your work around understanding safety constraints uh, and kind of modeling them with with an, with an additional Gaussian process. Um, one question that I had is: Do you need a distance from the safety boundary? Uh, because it seemed like you, you had a notion of I perform an experiment and then I get the notion of a distance of how far my, my safety envelope spreads from that point. Do you need that concept or can you do like a point wise estimate of that? Uh, you do. Um, so we modeled safety using a Gaussian process 
And as, as you know, um, a Gaussian process requires a kernel, and a kernel defines the notion of smoothness. And so how this method works, and you know, other people have worked on this type of method as well, is you sample a point near your lower confidence bound of things that are unsafe, and then you measure safety. And if that and, and if it turns out that it that that point is actually very safe, then the smoothness of your kernel allows you to extrapolate the safety boundary even further. And so if you don't have a kernel function that you that you feel confident captures the um, smoothness of how the safety function varies, then the guarantees are vacuous. Right. That that's interesting. And in in sense, my my follow up question was re is related to this notion of smoothness because I can imagine. I remember John Platt gave a talk at Neurips three year three or four years ago around something similar, where um, you have basically a safety constraint that basically becomes catastrophic at some point. So you have some some point in which your fusion reactor explodes. Uh, have you ever thought about, have you ever worked in that setting? Have you ever yeah, thought about so, that? So two comments. First of all, uh, John Platt's group works on much more complicated problems <laughs> than, than, the, than my group and my collaborators work on. Um, but, but a few comments. Number one, if you're in a domain where you can put an up, you can put a, a Lipschitz constant um, on the dynamics, or, or the or the how, how quickly the safety function varies. What that means for those of you who don't understand Lipschitz constants is you have an upper bound on how non-smooth or the second derivative of the safety function is. Then you can build a generic kernel, such as an RBF kernel with the appropriate um, bandwidth parameter th that satisfies that Lipschitz constant. So, so in a generic sense, you can, as long as the second derivative, if you will, or something that looks like a second derivative of your safety function is bounded and you know this a priori via prior domain knowledge, you can always do this. Uh, in John Platt's case, I'm imagining that the second derivative blows up. Like <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> and, and in those cases, the types of approaches that I'm describing, uh, they don't work out of the box. You'll need to basically use, I, if you want to directly use the type of approach that I've been working on and, and other people like uh, have worked on in similar ways, you would need to basically use a little bit of domain knowledge and then define a more conservative safety region where you know that the, the Lipschitz constant is controlled. Right. That, that, yeah, that, that's interesting. Those applications I always find kind of terrifying because when you start messing with catastrophic explosions, you kind of, I don't try, I, I love my Gaussian processes. I don't trust them that much in those regions. Um, I think, I guess related because we were talking about uh, kind of in some sense kernel design and designing the uh, structure of the model. Uh, have you found uh, and have you found that the so Gaussian processes are great in, in some in many ways, like uh, first of all, they're kind of easy to. In, in, from my point of view, they're interpretable in the sense that you can specify constraints, you can include prior knowledge about the function uh, that you're uh, trying to model. On the other end, I found that often they don't have quite the representational capacity that other models have, and you kind of trade that off for better uncertainty, cal better calibrated uncertainty, and better uncertainty estimation. Particularly in places, you know, when you're trying to maximize a function, like in Bayesian optimization, you want to be really confident about, you know, your um, your region, uh, uh, for your value of the function in that region. Have you found? Have you ever? Uh, problems with the representational capacity of Gaussian process and have you ever felt that you wanted to go maybe to kind of like deep kernel models or some, something like that, but then losing that uncertainty calibration? Sure. So one of the uh, topics that I touched on at the very end in Neural Lander where the drone needs to be able to land uh, quickly yet safely, um, that is a project where indeed uh, Gaussian processes um, uh, didn't work so well. And one way to think about it is that the aerodynamics of the drones uh, of the drone changes very drastically the closer it gets to the ground. And so, in in Gaussian process speak, that means that you have a non -heter you have a heterostatic uh, process um, where the kernel function or the noise function is non-uniform, um, de depending on how you want to model it. And those are and so um, we found that. Um, there is a way to impose a Lipschitz constant on the dynamics. You have to actually understand the aerodynamics of the drone. And through that, you can actually train a neural net to learn a representation where you can actually quantify safety uh, more accurately. And there, you can we exploited things like uh, spectral normalization, which imposes a Lipschitz constant on the neural net. 
And so you could check out that work on safe, uh, robust regression for safe exploration to learn more about that. But that was definitely one case where, um, you know, the, 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 the kernel design was very challenging. That's interesting. Um, yeah, we, we find it as well in, in, in some cases where in some sense Gaussian processes give you this way of reducing your sample complexity uh, because you can bake in a lot of knowledge about the smoothness of your function, about uh, you can even um, put a prior that is dict you know coming from physics or something like that. As soon as you start going into, um, I guess your case about heteroscedastic Gaussian process is one, it kind of blows up. Even the Gaussian, you know, the sample complexity goes up way beyond what you can realistically fit. Um, that that's very interesting. Um, I had one again, one, one more related point on on kind of learning these functions is that in the sp lower spinal injury project, uh, is, I think hopefully I, I summarized <laughs> it correctly. Um, you basically have a high dimensional space, which is it a continu was it a continuous space that then you discretize and then you reduce further? Like, uh, what was the what was the space of parameters there? What was sure. the design space? Sure. So I should first off mention that that project was a collaboration across many, many different groups with very uh, varying uh, expertise mm -hmm. uh, from neuroengineers to that make the, that study devices to neurosurgeons to clinicians to myself, who was, uh, in that collaboration was just a theoretical computer science algorithms person. And so uh, many of your questions I can't answer specifically because I don't know the answer, <laughs> but broad, but broadly speaking, um, uh, these uh, these stimul electrostimulators, at least the one that we worked with, um, had 16 nodes. Each one could be a cathode and an anode, uh, positively or negatively charged, with uh, varying frequencies in the modulation. So you can you have like a wavelength frequency uh, and frequency, so varying modulations. So it's a continuous action space in a 16 plus time, you know, high, really high dimensional space. And then we discretized. And so then the question is, okay, what is the level of discretization? The doctors would love to be to discretize as fine grain as possible, of course. Um, but then that inc increases your sample complexity. And so through a combination of domain knowledge, simulating how different electric potential fields permeate soft and hard tissue, and just general uh, assumptions about smoothness, you can build a kernel that could then first blow up the action space in a discrete way, and then you know map it down to a lower dimensional space using a kernel. I so actually okay, perfect. That is a good segue. My next question on that project, which is, could you have learned an interpretable um, low-dimensional space before um, before putting it the, through the kernel? Uh, sure. So my colleague Joe Burdick, who by the way I would say is the most central figure in that group, he brought everyone together. He actually had another project that studied this. Um, mm. I think in principle the answer is yes, but you know in practice it was a little bit trickier than. Uh, maybe initially thought, um, but I think that's a good direction to go towards in, in general where, you know, when you're working with domain experts, there's sort of a, a, a model building phase and then a, in, in their case, a clinical phase, right? Yeah. Um, and to what extent can we actually, and in, in all my talks, I assume that this model building phase, you just put in the hard work with your domain expert, and then I mostly talked about the quote unquote clinical phase or the, 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 the adaptation right. phase. I think a really interesting direction for future work is to actually put some rigor in the model building phase where things like interpretability, things like maybe building models and simulating what happens, it can be done in a way that's more mathematically rigorous and then and then and then be done in with the understanding that it's going to be used in this clinical adaptation phase in this joint pipeline. I think that's a really interesting direction for future work. Yeah, I, I agree. It's 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 interesting. It's a question that I get a lot as well um, in much in a much lower stake environment, which is in Bayesian optimization to automate um, the composition of machine learning systems or kind of ML ops and stuff like that. Everybody is very interested in okay, I want to design this path through the space of options, uh, but I care about the final answer and I will use it. But I also want to understand the path. Like, why did you make some choices and I guess we have, uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but my, my guess is that we have the tools from, you know, Gaussian processes are fairly interpretable. You can tell, given the separation between modeling what happens given in, in a specific region of the space and your decision to acquire that point or not, you kind of have some 
inspe introspection into what happened. But um, what do you think about it? Do you think they are inheritably interpretable? Do you think more work is needed? Uh, do you think we can interpret the path of a Bayesian optimization loop, for instance? Yeah, I, 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 I think that interpretation can be hard if it's in a very high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess it depends on exactly how you frame the problem. If you frame it as a pipeline approach where each individual module in the pipeline is can be thought of as a separate little Bayesian optimization problem, then the more interesting, then in some sense, the more interesting question is, well, how do you actually model the joint problem? Which then goes back to a high dimensional space. Right. How do these little more interpretable modules interact with each other and do the interactions behave in a highly nonlinear or whatever way that is hard to interpret? So I do think that that is, uh, I do think there are challenges in, in making that whole process more interpretable, yes. Uh, it's funny because one, in some sense, one of the most impactful things when we, we do our work is we fit this Gaussian process, we do all these things, and then is that plot. I think, I don't know the, the name exactly, but it's that plot with vertical bars corresponding to different parameters of the system, and then the lines connect them. Basically, you know, you have a high value for hyperparameter one, a low value for hyperparameter two. It's kind of like a kind of 2D representation of a high dimensional space. And in some sense, that's the plot that everybody gets the most insights out of because it shows the value of the function depending on the hyperparameter. One of the things that's also worth thinking about, and this is something that has come up more and more in my research, is that once you build these bigger systems, it's not just a single utility function. You might care about latency. You might care about uh, uh, memory, uh, minimizing the number of times you're, you have a total memory cache miss or something. Min and so you, ha you, might, you might have a a range of utility functions that you may want to simultaneously optimize for. So for, just to give you an example, in the uh, nanophotonics project where we are building these uh, specialized camera sensors, if you will, there's a range of things. There's the, the there's the, there's how sensitive are you to the wavelength of light that's targeted. There's the signal to noise ratio. There's, you know, the the, the, the width of that sensitivity. And, and, and if you actually talk to the, 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 the applied physicists how they actually came up with the weighting to balance all those objectives, you know, it's, you know, I would say it's fairly ad hoc, right? Yeah. And, and so what, what ultimately matters, of course, is you synthesize the camera, you take a picture, you see you see whether this picture is useful for downstream analysis, right? These hyperspectral imaging. And so there's, so, so you know, uh, even in that case, there were four terms in that objective function that were balanced in a sort of specific way, but you can imagine balancing them in different ways. You can imagine wanting to explore some notion of a Pareto frontier and then giving, handing that off to some downstream design. So I think, you know, there's a lot of complexity there that's worth thinking about in how to make it more mathematically rigorous from a machine learning standpoint. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is uh, you have applied successfully <laughs> business optimization in a variety of domains. Um, and they're very different domains, not just because they're different fields, but they're also because the design constraints are very different. Like in the batch basic optimization one, you know, every time somebody from biology approaches me saying, I want to use basic optimization, then you figure out they run things on 96 well plates. <laughs> uh, you know, there are, you can only run so many batches. So what do you think makes like a good setting for Bayesian optimization? We've seen it applied to battery charging, uh, to many scenarios, but what do you think are the characteristics of a scientific problem or industrial problem that fits the paradigm well? Um, you know, we live in a world where, you know, we, we have spectacular success stories from uh, deep reinforcement learning. And I think that um, the moment you can build a really accurate simulator of some kind, and this is one of the questions that I answered during the Q&A during the talk, the moment that you can build an, a simulator that you can reliably trust, uh, I, I do think that uh, thinking about things like deep reinforcement learning is probably you know, the way to go in many cases. Uh, of course, uh, in Bayesian optimization, it's really about in some sense, it, it it's about there's some notion the 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 data uh, uh, the data uh, availability is relatively modest. Mm -hmm. The ability to run experiments is relatively modest, and um, you really want to have and you have an ability to have a dialogue with a domain expert to understand how to build bake in some of that domain knowledge into this process. And, and and then, of course, from a research standpoint, for me, it's like, well, how do I make this a more mathematically general principle? But I think that to answer your question as a practitioner, it's really uh, 
the resource constraints are relatively modest. The, 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 the data availability is relatively modest. You have a domain expert who's willing to talk to you and that you can extract some insights about how to convert domain knowledge in either into a kernel or into some other you know, formulation or extension that I've talked about in my talks and other people as well. And that's, I think, the sweet spot where you can really push the theory and practice of Bayesian optimization and push it towards new applications at the same time. Awesome. Uh, thank you again for giving this incredible talk. Um, it's going to be available on YouTube, and it turns out a lot of people watch it on YouTube. So, if, I mean, if right. you're here, probably you have already watched it. You don't, but if you ever wanted to watch it again, it's going to be over there in a little bit. Uh, so thank you again, Yusum. Thank you.